In Act Two, Scene One of Julius Caesar, it's the Ides of March, the 15th, and Brutus is now leading the conspirators. The scene opens at Brutus's house in his orchard, where he's been up all night worried. His servant, Lucius, shows in the six conspirators. Cassius, Casca, and Cinna are joined by Metellus, Cimber, Decius, and Trebonius. Brutus says they will not swear an oath to each other because the worthiness of their cause bonds them together. Brutus is eloquent on this point. They will not stain the virtue of their enterprise with an oath, but work together against high-sided tyranny. Brutus then successfully persuades the conspirators not to involve Cicero, and he sways their decision not to kill Mark Antony. Cassius fears Antony's shrewd mind, but Brutus argues for as little bloodshed as possible. Brutus believes Antony will be powerless without Caesar. After they agree on a plan to get Caesar to the Senate, the conspirators leave. Portia, Brutus's wife, enters the orchard upset that Brutus hasn't confided in her. As his wife, she deserves to know his secrets. As proof of her constancy, she cuts her thigh, saying, Can I bear that and not my husband's secrets? Moved by his noble wife, Brutus promises to tell her everything. Later. This scene opens one month later on the day of the assassination, and Brutus has become the leader of the conspirators. The scene starts with Brutus's sleeplessness and closes with Portia's anxiety, a framework that heightens our awareness of what's coming and may indicate Shakespeare's judgment. Though we see the conspirators together, this scene is all about Brutus, his leadership of the conspiracy, his skillful rhetoric, and his relationship with Portia. His sleeplessness suggests inner turmoil, but his speeches are righteous, defiant, and committed. Speaking as leader of the conspirators, Brutus twice directs their decisions. But since Shakespeare is dramatizing historic events, the audience knows what's coming, turning Brutus's rhetorical victories into dramatic irony. While he proves to be right about Cicero, he is catastrophically wrong about Mark Antony.